Hi, I'm Chris Young, President Young Engineering Services. Uh, focus mostly on systems engineering solutions uh, for companies. And uh, what that really means is uh, I provide development platforms for companies to develop products on. Uh, so the, on the aerospace side, uh, time and money is the biggest uh, enemy that I have. Uh, you know, sometimes people say that you've got, well, you've got 18 months or 36 months to get the project done, but they don't understand that the sheer amount of certification testing that needs to take place uh, is very daunting. And what it does is it squeezes your window for design and development. So you need to, you, the, the need is to actually be correct the first time, reduce respins, you know, the, the, the front end simulation uh, and uh, forethought of what, how the system is going to behave and what its characteristics are is becoming way more crucial than it has in the past. So in terms of layout design techniques, uh, I point people to, uh, first of all, I point people to the PCB West conference, PCB East conference, because you'll see people there, uh, Rick Hartley, Lee Ritchie, I can just keep going. Uh, however, I consider those people to be pillars of principles, and I, I direct them to those people. And I know this isn't, isn't so much of a direct way of answering your question, seek out experts at what they do and discuss with them on how to do it. So that, like, we, if you're talking with like power distribution systems with Lee Ritchie, uh, he'll start to tell you, oh, okay, well, if you want a good power plane, well, you need to couple it closely with the ground plane so that you have good low impedance over a wider bandwidth, uh, frequency bandwidth. Uh, you start talking with Rick Hartley, he'll talk more about the systems engineering, a little bit more about the systems engineering approach and the, the principles that you need to adhere to to, be, you know, to uh, make sure that you're not violating any of the rules. Like if you're avionics, it's class three. All your annular rings, your accuracy of your drill holes, it's all tighter. You need to, you need to meet higher dielectric strength requirements. Uh, so you need to talk to these people because the IPC specifications are guideline, and then you seek out expertise to uh, figure out how to use those guidelines and where you need to maybe uh, do class three plus uh, to say. Uh, so. That's a good one. So a lot of places, uh, you know, with, when you're dealing with the, so avionics is following the same trend as everybody. Everything's getting smaller. Power density is getting higher. So what's happening is that uh, you've got a couple choices out there. You've got the FR 408 material, really high glass temperature, uh, decent characteristics in terms of if you need a high power, high density design, a high power density design, that's the type of material you wanna use. If you are not having such a higher power design, but you have a lot more, uh, if you're pushing the limits for aspect ratio on your board, a lot of companies tend to go towards a cheaper material, which is the 370 HR material. Uh, and the reason they do is it actually has a little bit better uh, Z-axis uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. Now where I see things going is on the automotive side. Uh, there's an EM370 material which has uh, a higher uh, glass temperature on par with FR408 and it has the lower uh, Z expansion. Uh, than, than the, than the uh, 370HR of what that actually, it's gonna allow people to uh, get smaller designs, push aspect ratios, or at least have more uh, slack or more headroom for your aspect ratio so your yields are better.
so a ground via is an inductor <laughs> a series via is a capacitor so it's like a, a and those are important aspects to understand that they're actually just not a, a means of getting from one layer to another as you, as the speeds increase as as they start moving along technology aircraft uh, right now they have the AFDX Ethernet it's 10 hundred base T well the TTGBE stuff that's going on like on the uh, 777 or the um, well that's actually on the Artemis uh, program on the on the Orion capsule they're using time trigger gigabit Ethernet so not only are you do you have the speeds of the 100 base uh, Ethernet you actually have amplitude modulation within the, the, the pulse frames so uh, that's when your via placement via design structures everything makes a, a, a huge difference Ah, okay, so uh, one of the key factors for me is temperature range. Uh, it's harder to get the military range components. Uh, they go down to minus 55, plus 125, plus 175. Uh, you know, when you talk about standard avionics products, the, uh, the temperature range, the standard temperature range for commercial aircraft in the electronics bay, uh, you have to be able to soak down at minus 55 degrees C and then also go up to plus 70 degrees C ambient. And uh, what, uh, so the, the issue there is that a tremendous amount of industrial components when we go down to more than minus 40 degrees C. And so that you have to be a little bit selective and you have to understand how to derate components for using them outside of their specified temperature range and you have to set up uh, screening and testing processes to be able to go through uh, and make sure it's going to work for your application. So there's still, uh, and it's not getting any better. I'm not seeing com companies go down to the minus 55C uh, very willingly. And uh, and what the other side of it is, is the packaging is a big deal because when, you, when you're up at altitude, it could be minus, 50 minus 55 in the eBay, and then as you as you go down to land, uh, the temperature. If you're going into Phoenix, so from the the moment that you actually start to descend to get to to for approach, you can see uh, you know 100 degrees C temperature ramp when you go to land, and then when you go to when, and when you take off as well. So there's significant temperature ramps at significant rates. I'm talking like five, sometimes seven, eight degrees C per minute. And uh, uh, you know, as you know, the aircraft are they're taking off and landing all day long. So you got to have a you have to have structure. The structure of the component has to support uh, the the compression and expansion of the PCB uh, around it. Uh, so interestingly enough, <clears throat> uh, so you can go, you, you know, there's the, when you talk about the, the design, there's the IPC, the 220, uh, the, the 2200 series, uh, IPC 6, uh, 6012, there's a, been a new update for the 6012, there's been the ES for the space and then the EM for the material that came out, I think some, circuit A 2020. Uh, so the standards, uh, you know, are used as guidelines to make sure that you're designing, uh, you know, center field, and you're not off in left field or right field. Uh, and again, uh, you know, you augment that with talking to uh, and uh, engaging experts. Again, like Lee Ritchie, uh, uh, Daniel Beaker, uh, NXP, uh, Rick Hartley. Uh, you know, some of these people. And other people around, like Stephen Chavez at uh, Siemens, uh, these people uh, 
have lived their life around these specifications. And it's a good idea to be aware of them and be aware of, you know, these people that uh, are the, you know, are the gatekeepers and the goalkeepers for these specifications. Uh, not that they're specifically related to IPC, but these are, these are people uh, that have, uh, you know, been some of the horsemen to be able to get the message out. Some of the testing, you know, is getting, it's, it's becoming very apparent that some of the testing that needs to take place, uh, the coupon testing, uh, the coupons need to be a little bit more, you know, uh, part of what some of these standards are is that they're, they're seeing deficiencies. You know, the coupons are typically off to the side and not the core into the, in the panel when you're doing the PCB design. And what's been happening in the past is that companies will do the, the coupon they'll do the test coupons and uh, they're not exactly representative of what is actually what the PCBs are because it's a it's almost like a silicon you know you get your you get your best results in the center of of the silicon uh, disc than you would on the outside and uh, so what's happening is is that uh, as, as things progress forward where the, that testing has become a little bit more uh, expected and looked at, uh, people are migrating uh, some of their test coupon structures onto the PCBs themselves to be able to get a more accurate representation of what the board is actually, how the board is actually constructed. Because it's no more, it's, no, it's, not, it's not becoming of, if we're plus or minus 20%, we're good. It's now getting to the point where it's like, we need to understand if we're plus or minus five, plus or minus 3% of nominal when we looking at when we're looking at impedance we're looking at drill holes we're looking at annular ring we just need to really and i i feel like there's been a, a more of a focus on that i know that other people might say oh well there's this detail this detail this detail uh, from my side from system standpoint i'm a little bit more interested in the verification and validation Yeah, so the uh, stack up strategy is uh, tightly coupled ground plane planes with power planes. And then understand the type of ripple voltage that you can have on your power on your power rails. That will dictate to you uh, what type of coupling you need. I mean, typically, uh, again, uh, you know, I'll, I'll quote Lee Ritchie on this. You know, you kind of you, you kind of want to sandwich a ground plane next to a power plane within about four mils. And that's a pretty well understood uh, relationship, well characterized by a lot of uh, companies and people in the industry. And, and uh, a well coupled power plane solves a lot of EM problems. Well, uh, so my biggest uh, concern is people trying to use Band-Aids to fix things. Uh, I know there's been a lot of talk about using ferrite beads and not, you know, like you shouldn't use them. Uh, you, you know, a ferrite bead is an inductor and it's typically been used, you know, it was intended to be used as a filter element, not so much an EM solution element. Uh, you know, some people happened upon that in the past and people go well it, it worked now we should all use it and the, the reality is is that no you need to design your power distribution system to be in line with your electrical requirements and, and that's what's going to help you with your power integrity and your signal integrity having an appropriate power distribution system it you know is actually uh, solves a lot of problems. It keeps you from having problems. You know, so it's an ounce of prevention is definitely worth a pound of cure in that case. I wouldn't be the best person to answer that, but I will say this from a size perspective. Um, where I do know that there are 
FPGA and processor and ASIC packages that use HDI technology. I haven't seen HDI technology implemented at a board level uh, yet in the avionics beyond research. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to fit in with the uh, fabrication processes that we have today. What I'm actually really looking forward to is the additive processes, the 3D printing of circuit boards, and I think that's where it's going to take off. Uh, I think that's, um, as, I, as, I, as I look forward, I, I think that the 3D uh, additive manufacturing processes are going to, uh, is going to be what makes that uh, technology fit in a lot of spaces, including avionics and space. Uh, so the experience I've had uh, is uh, what I've typically seen. I've seen between uh, 12 and about 20, 22 layers. Uh, and it has to do with, uh, uh, you know, there's typically a pretty decent practice from what I've seen of coupling power planes with uh, ground planes. So they will put in the extra planes to be able to have the power distribution system such that you don't have as many uh, EMC issues. And uh, it's just a, st it's a, it's a, it's a stack up I grew up with. I mean, it's just a signal, ground, power. And then if you have a tightly coupled uh, power plane to your ground plane, uh, from a signal perspective, from, from like a uh, AC type uh, impedance standpoint, the power planes look like ground planes, so you can actually put, you know, an asymmetrical strip line structure in between a power, you know, fit in between uh, power, uh, like a power plane and a non-coupled ground plane, and you'll be just fine. So when it comes to surface finishes, uh, you have to look at the application that you're, you're working in. Uh, so in avionics, some of the airborne uh, radar type equipment that they have, I'm talking TCAS, transponder, DME, uh, NAVCOM radios. Uh, some of the finish, the finish is important. You can't have immersion silver on a high power RF board. You're gonna get material migration that happens relatively quickly. Uh, you know, so the last design I worked on, it was still, we're using immersion tin uh, to be able to mitigate uh, the material migration and people go well okay so you got tin whiskers and whatnot why wouldn't you go to gold plating well the problem with that is that nickels uh, nickel is used underneath gold plating to to support it and reinforce it and that causes excessive loss when you're talking about high power rf and it, it what you end up dealing with is uh it's in significant impedance mismatches just due to the surface finish that you're using. And, uh, and it may not be present at low power. You can put a VNA on there and go, okay, I don't really see what's going on. And then once you get, once you start transmitting, uh, you know, thousand watt peak power pulses, you're like, wow, okay. There's significant deformation in my pulse, in, the, in these RF pulses. I don't understand what's going on. It's literally just a surface finish that you used.